Hey, Pastor Justin here. Thank you so much for tuning in to our Human Sexuality and the Bible series. The reason why we're in this series is because as a congregation, we've been walking through the book of 1 Corinthians and the author, Paul, devotes three whole chapters to the topic of sex and our bodies. So this is what you might just call a series within a series. This is our attempt as pastors to lead and guide our congregation with respect to all areas of discipleship, including our sexuality. And we want to do this with grace and with truth, with clarity and with compassion. And so our hope and prayer is that this would be a resource to you to help you go deeper in your discipleship journey with Jesus. Blessings. Good morning. Thanks for joining us this morning. I'm really glad you're here. If you have your Bible, why don't you go ahead and grab that and look for Genesis chapter 2. And also, if you want to put a tab there, also look for the book of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 18 and Leviticus chapter 20. Uh, While you're looking for that, I, I want to acknowledge something on the front end that I'm probably not the only person in this room who's a little bit nervous this morning. So if if you are someone who has same-sex attraction and you haven't told another living soul, or you are someone who is uh, affirming, or you are someone who identifies with the LGBTQ community, or you are someone who is in a same-sex relationship or has a same-sex marriage, I would assume that you're a little bit nervous for what I'm about to say. So right off the bat, if you are someone who is gay or lesbian or trans or part of the LGBTQ community, there's a couple of things that I want to share with you and the rest of you can listen in. I recognize that as a pastor, you might see me as a bit of a uh, representative Christian, and so you kind of, you look through me and you see the church, and you see Christianity in the main, you see all the decisions that churches have made, and, and so as a sort of representative Christian, I just want to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the hatred and animosity, dislike, and disdain that you have experienced at the hands of other Christians. I'm frustrated by it. I'm repulsed by it because I think it breaks the heart of God. And before we start this morning, I think the very first thing that we have to do is to affirm the inherent God-given dignity that we all have as image bearers of God. And I recognize that for you, you've experienced much of that at the hands of other Christians. And so you're not quite sure if you want to enter back into a space where there's a whole bunch of Christians when when you've experienced some of the things that you have. And so I just want to say I'm sorry, and I'd love to hear your story. The second thing I want to share with you, and be clear on this, you matter 
to God. It's really interesting. Um, I shared this with the whole congregation a couple of weeks back, that when God created the universe, he said it was good. But when God created you and knit you together in your mother's womb, he said, very good, very good. You have been, when you were knit together in your mother's womb, God leapt for joy. And he put himself, his own image, his own likeness in you. I I often think of uh, the quote from John Perkins when, when he says this. Can we show the slide? He said, we don't give people dignity, we affirm it. And so here's what I want you to know. You matter to God. You are loved by God. You are cherished by God. The third thing I want to say is because you matter to God, you matter to me. And I would love the opportunity to hear your story I'd love to meet for coffee with you, to pray with you, to cry with you, to hear your stories. Uh, It's it's kind of a busy time right now, but just reach out. I will make time for you. I would love to hear your story. And fourth and finally, because you matter to God, you matter to this church. Now, I'm not saying we're perfect. Can I get an amen? Amen. We're not perfect. Every single person in this room is a broken, sinful person in need of the grace, the unmerited mercy of God. Like like we just sang about every single person in this room. What draws us all together isn't our race, isn't our ethnicity, isn't our cultural history. There's only one reason why every single person in this room feels as though they are the family of one another, and it's because we have been set free by the blood of the Lamb. That the the doorposts of our heart have been wiped by the blood of the Lamb so that we have been set free on account of what Jesus Christ has done. And so if you need some of that, come on in. Come on in. We need you and you need us. And we would love to be the family of God to you. I can honestly tell you that this is a church that loves Jesus, that wants to make much of Jesus, and loves his people. And so I'm really glad that you're here. So this morning, we're, we're looking at one question and one question only, and it's what does the Bible say about homosexuality? And as we do that, Here's what I want to do. I want to handle this topic biblically and lovingly. I want to handle it carefully and truthfully, humbly and boldly, sensitively and with clarity. And at the end of our time this morning, I hope you can see that, that I did everything that I could to do that, to be as clear as possible to help us understand the tenets of Scripture so that we can make much of Jesus and his word. But if there are areas in which I have failed in that, please let me know so I can keep learning. But if we don't see eye to eye on this, here's what I would say about that. Scripture says that teachers like myself will be judged most harshly on account of our influence that we carry. It just so happens to be my least favorite verse. So pray for me. Right now, say say a quick prayer. Ask for the Lord to give me his words to speak with clarity, to speak with truth that we would not hear Justin's words. No one should care about Justin's words, but we should care about Jesus' word. For every single person who's a Christian, we should care about the words of Jesus. And so as we look at this question, what does the Bible say about homosexuality, that is a very, very difficult and different question than what we typically ask. We typically ask questions like, what do I think about it? Or how do I feel? Or how do my experiences inform my perspective with respect to a particular topic? And those are important questions, don't get me wrong. But for the Christian, it is not the ultimate question. The ultimate question that we ask is, what does the word of God say? Because we believe that the word of God gives light and life to all who listen. And so we yield to the word of God, even when we disagree. Because here's here's the reason why. Here's the reason why it's not the ultimate question. We learned this all the way back in week one of this series. Jeremiah 17 says this. 
The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? That's our hearts. And then we read in Heidelberg Catechism, question and answer five, it says, I'm inclined by nature to hate God and my, na- and my neighbor. I have a natural proclivity not to love my neighbor, not to love God, not to make much of God, but to hate God and to be my own God and to establish my own rule and reign over God's kingdom, to build my own little mini kingdom and to hate my neighbor. And then we read in Psalm 53, it says these words, there is no one who does good. That's all y'all. Tell your neighbor, you don't do good. God looks down from heaven on all humankind to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. Everyone has turned away. All have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. And so we can't rely on our own feelings or our own sentiments, or our own desires. Every single person in this room has disordered desires. We're all kind of on the even playing field here. All of us have disordered desires. And so the question we have to ask is, what does the Bible say? But do you notice what I just said? The, the question I said, this is for Christians, right? It's for Christians. So again, I always want you to be thinking about us having a conversation at Starbucks, and we're always asking worldview questions first. So with respect to questions where we might disagree with each other, there's two questions I always want to encourage you to ask. The first question is, is Jesus the Lord of your life? Is Jesus the Lord of your life? That's the worldview question. If they say no, Why would we spend any time talking about Jesus' righteous rules without first introducing them to Jesus? So if they say, no, I'm a nihilist or I'm agnostic, I'm not so sure, I'm an atheist, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a Muslim, you say, okay, tell me more about that. Does that authority love you? Does that authority have in mind what is best for you? What experiences have you had within that religion or that belief system? Tell me more. Be curious. Learn more about their story. And then you'll be given the opportunity to tell them your story and how Jesus has changed your life. An opportunity to talk about Jesus. But if they say yes... If they say yes, then you go to the second question. Do you believe that the Bible is the ultimate authority of your life? And most of which, if they believe in Jesus, will say yes, but some might say no. Some might might say, you know what, I I think it's kind of an old, antiquated book. I'm, I'm spiritual. I love Jesus, but I'm spiritual. And so you'll have to ask more questions about that. But if they say yes to both of those questions, then you finally get to say something like this. Okay, let's open our Bibles and seek to understand God's word and God's will for our life in every sphere of life. Not just our sexuality, but our time, our money, our politics, our ethics, everything. We yield to the word of God. So I wanna remind you of that worldviews framework that we've been talking about a lot. So is Jesus the Lord of your life? That's the worldviews question, right? Is the word of God the ultimate authority of your life? When, When the Bible says jump, do you say how high? That's the authority question. And then the assumption is, can we collectively make the assumption that Jesus is the Lord of your life and the Lord of my life, and so as we look at the Word, we will allow the Word to inform us and not us to inform the Word. And then we can talk about any moral issues that we need to talk about. But it's always in the context of Christian love. We should never insist on moralizing people who don't know Jesus. But we should always be ready as Christians to seek to understand His Word and His will for our life. But get this, this is the first point that I put in your note sheet. If you're taking notes this morning, I put it this way. The mark of a Christian is not just obeying the Bible when you agree with it, but especially when you disagree. Especially when you disagree. And and that's on any matter, right? So we could talk about um, sex outside of marriage. Two consenting adults having a sexual relationship with each other before they get married. What's the harm in that? And yet the Bible has things to say about that. Or what about the the topic of uh, how you use your money? Do you know that the Bible talks about how you personally should use your money more than 800 times? It's all up in your business. Or what about the topic of polygamy? The idea that you could have three, four, or five different people form a marriage covenant with each other. If if it doesn't hurt someone else, if it doesn't break my arm, it doesn't break their arm, what's the harm in that? And yet, here's my point. We never look at the words of Scripture and say, you know what, I I think it's a little bit antiquated, I think it needs an update. 
Instead, we say, this is the word of God, which is timeless and true. Help, un- help me understand how to live in obedience to your will. Help me to understand how to live in obedience to your will. And so we're simply going to look at this one question. What does the Bible say about homosexuality? And my experience as a pastor is I've discovered this. With respect to this topic, what the Bible says is often assumed, not studied. And that's on both sides. You know, there's, there's far too many Christians who say things like, um, homosexual unions are prohibited by Scripture and therefore are morally wrong. And if, if I gave them the Bible and I said, uh, could, could you tell me where that is? They, they would say, I don't know, Sodom and Gomorrah. It's in there. It's in there. I, I just don't know where. On, on the other side, there, there's a, a lot of Christians who say things like, well, what, homo, what the Bible is talking about with respect to homosexuality is, is not what we're talking about today. Not a monogamous, consensual, lifelong, exclusive co- um, covenanting of people. It's talking about rape, it's talking about pederasty, it's talking about sexual exploitation, but not that, not that, because they've heard someone say that before. And so there's so much assuming on both sides. And this is the reason, friends, why I've chosen to take two weeks as opposed to one week on this topic. Two, two reasons why, ultimately. Because with respect to every sexual topic that's identified in 1 Corinthians 5 and 6, uh, we've really grappled and struggled with. So human sexuality in our bodies, divorce, marriage, singleness, all these topics we've grappled with. But with respect to homosexuality, we've really, really struggled. And more than that, this is the one topic in which I I think we have just been a really terrible witness overall as a capital C church. And so I want to take a little bit more time for us to review this together. And so what we have to do here, friends, we, we have to avoid cheap, shallow sound bites like God made Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Or on the other side, love is love. We, we got to avoid um, 40 character tweetable tweets. We got to go deeper. We have to use our intellect. We have to have a consistent biblical hermeneutic to fully understand what God is saying, what his will is for our lives Because what we're talking about here is not issues. We're talking about people who are made in the image and the likeness of God. It doesn't work in a tweet. We have to go deeper. We have to go deeper. So let's start with a question. The question is this. How many passages directly talk about homosexuality in the Bible? Is it 100? Is it 50? Is it 20? The answer is six. Six times. And before we finish today, I want to tell you that it's actually five, not six, because one of the ones that we use most frequently has nothing to do with our conversation today. Just five times. And by comparison and contrast, do you know how many times the Bible talks about our money? 2,000 times. And like I shared with you already, 800 of those 2,000 times is how you personally should use your money. And what I find is Christians are far more interested in talking about homosexuality than how they use their money. But that's another sermon for another time. So let's look at this. How are we going to do this? We're going to look at these six passages along with two more that aren't directly tied to homosexuality but inform our perspective on what God says about marriage in the main. And we're going to take two weeks to look at this. So I want to start with Genesis chapter 1 and 2. If you have your Bible open, look at Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. I'm going to trust you to read the context later. I would love to do that. We just don't have the time. All of Genesis 1, all of Genesis 2, I want to encourage you to read a little bit later today. But two verses that are relevant for our conversation today. The first one, Genesis 1:27, and it says this. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Now, we're not talking about marriage just yet. Whether you're single or married, whether you are widowed or divorced, whether you are fertile or infertile, every human being bears the image and the likeness of God. That's the thrust of Genesis chapter 1. 
And so you can look at your neighbor and you can tell them, you bear the image of God. Go ahead, look at your neighbor, tell them, you bear the image of God. What an encouragement, what a joy. Every single person in this room, you all bear the image of God. That's the point. And that was an outlandish claim at this time in which scripture was written, in which women were not perceived as people who were equal in the eyes of others in comparison to men. And God says, men bear the image of God, women bear the image of God, and you are all worthy of dignity. And then we read Genesis chapter two, verse 18, and this is especially relevant for our time today. It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And admittedly, whenever we read the word helper in our 21st century Western ears, we we think of it as somewhat of a condescending term. We we think it might sound a little bit sexist. Like I have a four-year-old daughter. Her name is Kate. Sometimes she helps around the house, and and I'll call her daddy's little helper, right? But you all know that a four-year-old daughter doesn't help. It just takes twice as long to do whatever you're planning on doing. And so if we have that kind of idea about helper, what's what's all this about? And yet, here's what's really interesting. There's literally one being that is given the term helper in the Old Testament by far and away more than anyone else. Can you think of who that is? God. It's the Hebrew word ezer. That's, That's the word helper. And God is the great ezer the great helper to the people of Israel. And so if we think there's any form of condescension in this, there is not. In the ears of Israel, when they hear, again, thinking about the context, that the woman, the wife, is the easer of the man, they are astounded. Not only does the woman bear the image of God, but also, just like God to Israel, she is the easer to her husband, craziness, an incredible affirmation of men and women both bearing the image of God. Now, with respect to our topic, here's what's important. Here's what I want you to consider. The most common argument from the affirming position goes a little bit like this. Eve was the perfect easer, the perfect helper for Adam, not because she was female, but because she was human. Now, that's important, isn't it? Like, that, that's super important. If the whole point, the whole thrust of this was God wanted two humans and not a man and a woman, then, then that's instructive to us. But here's what I want us to consider for a moment. There is some truth to this. James Brownson, who is considered to be the, the leading biblical scholar from the affirming position, he is one of many who makes this argument. And Scripture actually gives some of that. Let me read this to you. This is Genesis 2. 19 and 20. It says this, now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all of the wild animals. Take note of that, wild animals. And all the birds in the sky. Okay, we're talking about different kinds of creatures. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them and whatever the man called each living creature, that's what its name was. So the man gave names to the livestock, to the birds of the sky, and to all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So Adam's looking around and he says, that's not gonna work. A bird, a fish, a reptile, amphibian, a beast of the field, They're not like me. They're not human. They're not human. But here's the question that we have to ask ourselves today, which is relevant to our conversation. Was it only Eve's humanness that qualified her as a suitable helper? Was it only her humanness? So here's what I see, and it requires us to look at the Hebrew word for suitable, which is the word konegdo. Say konegdo. Kind of a fun word. And so it's a really difficult word to translate because it's literally only used in the entire Bible once, right here. And, and scholars say you can't get what is called a semantic range to understand how this word is used in other contexts. Because again, we, we don't speak Hebrew, right? So typically what they'll do is they'll find 
poetry, they'll find literature, they'll find religious textbooks, they'll find all sorts of references in which this word is used to cross-reference to help us understand most acutely and accurately what this word is seeking to convey to our English ears. But if you only have one time in which it's used, you go, well, I, I don't fully understand what this word means. And it's a brand new word. It's a made up word because it is a compound word of two different Hebrew words. So again, that makes it difficult for us to fully understand. However, the two words that are used to come up with Konegdo are used all the time. All the time. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of times. And so here are the two words. The word K, which means as or like. So think sameness on this. And then the word neged, which means opposite or against. So here you should be thinking about difference. So perhaps the best, most literal translation that we could get for the word konegdo would go something like this. Something like same as but opposite him. Clear as mud, right? Same as but opposite him. Now that's really interesting. Why would the author of scripture use the word konegdo? And here's my question for, for those of us who have the affirming position. I would want to lay this out before you. If it were simply Eve's humanness that made her a suitable pair to Adam, then why not just use the first half of the word konegdo? Why not just use the word K, which means as or like, to indicate that they're both human, they're both the same? Why use the word neged, which literally means opposite, in order to make the point? And why make a brand new compound word, never before used, never to be used again, in order to make that point? I just, I, I don't see that. It's a question for me that I think we all have to wrestle with. And so what I see from this is that God is conveying both their similarity, K, and their dissimilarity, neged, in order to make his point, in order to instruct us on what the creation mandate is all about. So let's look at the, um, the grid one more time. So she is not an animal. Eve is not a bird. Eve is not a fish or a reptile. And in that way, she is the same as Adam. She's human. However, she's also neged from Adam. She's also different because she is female, not male. And so she is different. And so that's what I see in Genesis chapter 2. So I put it this way in your note sheet. Genesis chapter 2 is God's design for marriage and requires both partners, A, to be human, that's K, to be from different families, that's the context of Genesis 1 and 2 that you can read later, and number three, to display biological or sexual difference, that's neged. Those three things. But there's a second question that we have to ask that I think is equally important, and James Brownson also picks up on this. He, he said, and other um, affirming scholars say that Genesis chapter two is not prescriptive. It's merely descriptive of the text. So let me give you an example of this. Let's say you want to uh, talk to God and you want to use God's word to hear his voice and you say, God, speak to me today. And then you open up the Bible to Genesis chapter four and it says, Cain killed his brother Abel. Okay, that's strange. And then you open up to Luke chapter 10 and it says, go ye and do likewise. And you close the book, you're like, okay, I'm just gonna put this down and come back to it later. That is not prescriptive, okay? That is descriptive. That's descriptive of the text. We would not say, therefore, we should go and do those things. In the same way, is God just giving us a creative story to highlight that what we really need here is human beings to be united together? And it doesn't have to necessarily be uh, a man and a woman, but it could also be a man and a man or a woman and a woman. That's instructive. That's an important question for us to consider. But here's the answer that, that I would give to that. Here's what I see in the text. Look with me at Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. We see from here that the author doesn't talk about Adam and Eve any longer. He goes up to 30,000 feet in the air, and then he starts this way. All your translations will say something like, 
therefore, or it'll say, that is why, or for this reason. In light of everything that you have heard about the Konegdo, that they are the same, indicating they're human, but they're different, they're man and woman. Therefore, that is why, not Adam, a man. A man leaves his father and mother and is united to not Eve, but his wife, and they become one flesh. And so as I read the text, I see this as something that is prescriptive, not something that is merely descriptive of the text. Now, every biblical scholar and theologian knows that you can't squeeze too much out of any one word. We can't say, see, God prohibits same-sex unions on account of Konegdo. That, that would be irresponsible. This is just one quick reference. I think it lays a foundation. I think it's the opportunity for us to say, okay, what does the rest of Scripture have to say about this? But we have to keep reading. So let's take a look now at Genesis chapter 19. If you have your Bibles open, I'd love for you to read this with me. Genesis 19, this is a text that I think has done more damage to this topic than any other one. As I've shared with you already, um, it's the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And we still think about that today. The crime of sodomy comes from Genesis 19. Typically, when you ask a Christian, you know, why does God prohibit same-sex unions? They think of Genesis 19. Um, I shared with you a video from three weeks ago. There was a woman who had a big sign that said, God hates fags, Genesis 19. Like, this chapter has been abused, but I want you to see it. I was so tempted to skip it, but I just want you to see why we shouldn't use this text. So pick up with me at verse 4. This is where two angels, they come to visit Lot, they come to his house, but they look like men. They look like beautiful, attractive men. Before they had gone to bed, all the men from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you, and you can do whatever you would like with them. That's terrible. But don't do anything to these men, for they have come under the protection of my roof. Get out of the way, they replied. This fellow came here as a foreigner, and now he wants to play the judge. We'll treat you worse than them. They kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. But the men inside reached out and pulled Lot back into the house and shut the door. Then they struck the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, with blindness, so that they could not find the door. These two men said to Lot, do you have anyone else here, sons-in-law, sons or daughters or anyone else in the city who belongs to you? Get them out of here because we are going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against its people is so great that he has sent us to destroy it. There's two things that, that I want you to see in this. Number one, I don't know of a heterosexual or homosexual person who condones this. I don't know anyone on the planet who, who would say that this is appropriate behavior. This is violent gang rape. That, that's what's occurring in this text. It's not a mutual, loving, monogamous, same-sex union. And so, so listen, if, if you feel that same-sex relationships are prohibited from Scripture, don't use this text. Don't use this as a proof text. You can't find a gay man or woman who, who would affirm of this. And, and it breaks my heart that it's used so often. Second, and this grieves me, if you were to ask many Christians why same-sex unions are prohibited, they would use Genesis 19. But here's the thing, we don't have to ask. We know God tells us why he destroyed Sodom. And we read this in Ezekiel 16. You can take note of uh, the chapter, read the whole context later, but two verses that are applicable for us right now. It says this, now, this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Therefore, I did away with them as you have seen. So why was Sodom destroyed in a word? 
because of their pride, because of their, e- their ego, because of their unwillingness to help their neighbor. Now, when, when he talks about detestable things, did that include um, prostitution and gang rape? Um, yeah, it did, but both homosexual and heterosexual gang rape, presumably. All of it together. And, but the, the stated reason why Sodom was destroyed was because of their pride. And so, again, it just breaks my heart that it's used so often. So on Genesis 19, I put it this way in your note sheet, Genesis 19 cannot be used to condemn all homosexual behavior. This was a story of gang rape. It has nothing to do with a consensual relationship. Enough on that. So now turn with me to the book of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 18. Who here, by a show of hands, when you get to your Bible reading plan on the book of Leviticus, you just go, yahoo! Anyone? All right, so, like, we're, we're all in this together. I recognize that Leviticus is kind of dry, and we, we question its relevance, and we, we're curious as to what elements of Leviticus are still applicable to us today, which ones are not, and especially for our topic today, this is a really, really important question. So, the theme of the book of Leviticus is holiness. The word holy shows up 87 times in this book. The people of Israel, they're about to go into the promised land, and God wants to give Israel, the sovereign nation under God, um, a series of rules and regulations so that they can be set apart from all the other nations, so that they can be declared holy, and in so doing, that God would bring others to himself. That is the desire. That is the goal of Leviticus. And as we look at this chapter, and I'm just going to forewarn you, um, we're about to enter into the sexual gutter, okay? But as you read this, and I'm going to read a whole lot of this section, I want to ask you this question. If you're thinking about pulling out uh, one of these commands and saying that they're no longer applicable to us today, is there a second or a third that you would be willing to pull out with it? I think that's a really important question. So let's pick up here at verse six. No one is to approach any close relative to have sexual relations, I am the Lord. Do not dishonor your father by having sexual relations with your mother. She is your mother, do not have relations with her. Do not have sexual relations with your father's wife, that would dishonor your father. Do not have sexual relations with your sister, either your father's daughter or your mother's daughter, whether she was born in the same home or elsewhere. Do not have sexual relations with your son's daughter or your daughter's daughter. That would dishonor you. Do not have sexual relations with the daughter of your father's wife, born to your father. She is your sister. Do not have sexual relations with your father's sister. She is your father's close relative. Do not have sexual relations with your mother's sister because she is your mother's close relative. Do not dishonor your father's brother by approaching his wife to have sexual relations. She is your aunt. Apparently, some of these things have to be said. Do not have sexual relations with your daughter-in-law. She is your son's wife. Do not have relations with her. Do not have sexual relations with your brother's wife. That would dishonor your brother. Do not have sexual relations with both a woman and her daughter. Do not have sexual relations with either her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter. They are close relatives. That is wickedness. Do not take your wife's sister as a rival wife and have sexual relations with her while your wife is living. Like, yeah, you got to say it, I guess. Do not approach a woman to have sexual relations during the uncleanness of her monthly period. Do not have sexual relations with your neighbor's wife and defile yourself with her. Do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Molech, for you must not profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman that is detestable. Do not have sexual relations with an animal and defile yourself with it. A woman must not present herself to an animal to have sexual relations with it. This is a perversion. Do not defile yourself in any of these ways because this is how the nations that I'm going to drive out because you, def- you became defiled. Even the land was defiled, so I punished it for its sin, and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you must keep my decrees and my laws. The native born and the foreigners residing among you must not do anything, deta- any of these detestable things. 
For all these things were done by the people who lived in the land before you, and the land became defiled. And if you defile the land, it will vomit you out as it vomited out the nations that were before you. Everyone who does any of these detestable things, such persons must be cut off from their own people. Keep my requirements. Do not follow any of the detestable customs that were practiced before you came, and do not defile yourselves with them. I am the Lord your God. So a whole list full of sexual commands. Now, here's what I want to do next. I want to read Leviticus chapter 20. I'm not going to read the whole chapter because I think you get the gist. But let's read Leviticus 20, verse 13, as it applies to our uh, topic today. If a man has sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. They are to be put to death. Their blood will be on their own heads. So again, the question that I want to ask is, if we're thinking about pulling out one of these commands and, and saying that it no longer applies, is there a second or a third that you'd be willing to pull out with it. And both of these, we see a very similar list. Don't commit incest, uh, don't have sex with family members, don't have sex with animals or with your neighbor's wife. Almost all of them bringing the death penalty for the nation of Israel, and you can read that whole chapter later. So Genesis chapter 19 is not uh, a helpful chapter with respect to this topic. It's very clearly gang rape, not a monogamous, consensual sexual relationship. But Leviticus 18 and 20, now we have to ask two new, very important questions of these texts. So let's look at these questions. What type of sexuality is this chapter forbidding? And then number two, equally important, do we still follow the laws from Leviticus? Are they still relevant for Christians today. So let's look at that first question first, and let's look at the two relevant passages that we've looked at already. We'll have them up on the screen. So the first one, do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. And the second is, if a man has sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. And so the focus here is on biological sex. So this is the way that I put it in your note sheet. The focus in Leviticus 18 and 20 is biological sex. Biological sex. Two people of the same sex are not to be involved sexually the way two people of the opposite sex are permitted to be. Thus, the reference as a man does with a woman. But there's one more thing that we need to read from chapter 20. I want you to look again at this with me, the second part here. If a man has sexual relations with a man, as one does with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. They are both to be put to death. Now, why is that important? Why even bring that up? Like you, or like me, perhaps it makes you feel a little bit icky. But that would happen during that time. But here's, here's why it's relevant for us today. Because many modern affirming interpretations would say that what is being condemned here is, is something else. So let me give you two examples. Um, affirming scholar and author Matthew Vines, he says that what is being condemned here is pederasty. That's where uh, men have sex with boys, adolescent boys. Uh, what James Brownson says in his book is considered to be like the magnum opus of the affirming interpretation. What he says is that what is likely being um, argued here is against things like cultic prostitution and sexual exploitation, and the assumption is that the neighboring Canaanites, they were involved in this, even though there's no historical evidence to support that. But let's just seed the ground and, and say maybe that is the case. Maybe that's what's going on here. We have things like pederasty, sexual exploitation, cultic prostitution, these are the things that are going on in, in this situation. If that is the case, I now have two new questions that I just can't get over, that I'm, I'm really grappling with, and it really comes from this question. If either of these interpretations are true, then wouldn't only the active aggressor be put to death? Otherwise, we got really tough questions. For instance, let's look at these two questions. Why would God condemn to death innocent and exploited victims? Right, so if it's a case of pederasty, a man with an adolescent boy, you're putting the boy to death? 
Or it's a case of uh, cultic or temple prostitution, and there's someone who got caught up in the, the evil and the atrocities of, of prostitution, oftentimes teenage kids. You're putting that kid to death? And I think, I think that's a hard question, that, that if you are of the affirming interpretation, you've got to grapple with that. You have to ask that question. And then the second question, why the repeated comparative phrase, as one does with a woman? Why the comparison and contrast? I don't think it's necessary if we're not talking about a same-sex sexual relationship that is monogamous, it is consensual. Both parties are agreeing to this. And so here's what I see from the text. Both participants are to be put to death. Both are willing participants. This is not rape or cultic prostitution. It's not pederasty or any other form of sexual exploitation. It is a consensual sexual relationship. But we can't stop there. We, we have to ask a second and equally important question, and it is this question. Do we still follow laws from Leviticus? Are they still relevant to us today? See, one of the common arguments against Christianity is that Christians pick and choose which laws are still relevant to their lives today. And so we say, that one, no longer important. That one, that's important. We've got to hang on to that one. There's no rhyme or reason to it. And through Christian institutionalism over the years, we've just picked and chose which ones we don't like. And so, like, let me just give you a couple examples of this. Do you know that Leviticus has laws against wearing two different kinds of fabric? So, look at your neighbor's tag. If it says polycotton blend, they're sinners. Or uh, do you have a garden that has different kinds of vegetables on the same row? If that's the case, sin. Or what about bacon? Who here by show of hands eats bacon? Come on, raise your hand. Look at all you sinners. My goodness, eating bacon. And I think one of the best parts of the new covenant that Jesus has come is that we can finally eat bacon. But in Leviticus, you can't. You can't. And so are, are we picking and choosing which ones we like, which ones we don't like? And so I'm going to keep reminding you, like, we have to avoid cheap, shallow sound bites that work in a tweetable tweet. We got to go deeper. We have to engage our minds. We have to have a consistent hermeneutic with respect to Scripture, seeking to allow the Word of God to inform us and not us to inform the Word. And so with respect to this question... We have to realize that there are three different kinds of laws that are identified in the book of Leviticus. Let me uh, just look at them with you for a second. The first is ceremonial laws, that's engaging feasts and sacrifices. The second one is civil laws in order to govern the nation of Israel, which was a, a theocracy under God. And then the third was moral laws, and these are timeless laws in all times and in all places. So let's look at a couple examples. For instance, a ceremonial law is where Leviticus says, you must sacrifice a burnt offering unto the Lord. And there are so many laws that speak to the ceremonial code of the people of Israel. But for those of us who are Christians, now that we see Jesus... Christ as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, says John the Baptist, then it would actually not be morally ambiguous it wouldn't be morally like you can choose to do it or not do it. It would be wrong, wrong for us to engage in ceremonial laws. We think about Hebrews chapter 7 in which it says that Jesus is the one for all people in all times and place sacrifice for our sins. Period. Dot. It is by grace you have been saved through faith in Christ the end. And so if all of us you know, after the service, we decide to have a potluck outside and, you know, we, we slit the neck of a lamb and we throw it up on the altar and we burn the lamb and then we all bow down and worship God after our sacrifice. Wrong. Not ambiguous. Wrong. And so we even think about uh, passages like Colossians chapter 2. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So what Paul is saying is that ceremonial laws are now done away with through the person and work of Jesus. It still informs us. I, I think the way we should read Leviticus, when we get through all the ceremonial laws, 
We should have tears in our eyes as it informs us of just how costly the death of Jesus was for us. That's how we read Leviticus now. We go, oh my goodness, every single sacrifice, thousands upon thousands of spotless lambs, and guess what? It did nothing to address the principal debt of sin, only the interest, and all of us still are caught up in our sins until Jesus, until Jesus. And so that's the reason why we still read Leviticus, even though it's hard, but we don't think about the ceremonial laws in the same way. With respect to uh, civil laws, here's an example of that one. It'd be something like um, if you borrow an animal and the animal dies in your possession, what reparations do you need to give your neighbor? And so because of time, I'm just going to fly through this one. Um, but basically what's going on here is they don't necessarily have an impact on us today because we're not part of the sovereign nation or the theocracy of Israel any longer. We have our own laws in Canada that we have to abide by. But those are still done away with as well. So we don't follow civil laws. But a moral law, a moral law, is something that reveals God's heart and will in all times and places. And my encouragement to you as God-fearing Christians is to always ask this question. What is this text addressing? Ceremonial laws or civil laws or moral, timeless laws of God? And that's the reason why I read through all of Leviticus chapter 18. Because one of the things Leviticus often does, there's some exceptions, but they bunch them together just so that you know, so that you can see that, okay, this is a ceremonial section. This is a civil section. This is a moral section. And even in Leviticus chapter 18, the only exception to this is any reference to blood. To blood because that's also tied up in the ceremonial laws. But beyond that, everything in Leviticus 18 is part of the moral law. And therefore, we look at it as though it is still timeless and true for us today. One such example of that we read five weeks ago, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and Paul is addressing a man who is having uh, sexual relations with his mother-in-law. He says that is detestable. Where does that come from? Leviticus 18. Leviticus 18, same chapter. And so here, I want to show you this. I want to show you a grid of uh, many, I couldn't get them all on, but many of the sexual sins that are identified in Leviticus 18 and 20. Again, I want to ask you that question. If we're thinking about removing one, which two would you remove? Which two? Incest, lying, adultery, theft, child sacrifice, oppressing others, bestiality, loving your neighbor as yourself, which Jesus says is the greatest commandment, and it's sandwiched between Leviticus 18 and 20, the verses that we're looking at today. Same-sex sexual relations, slander, cursing the deaf, taking the Lord's name in vain, hating your brother, making your daughter a prostitute, turning to witches or necromancers. So if we're thinking about removing one, which, which two, which extra one is coming along with it? Again, we, we have to look at the text for what the text is saying, not what we want it to say, or not our own desires. So third and finally, I, I think we should consider this, and I put this in your note sheet. The clearest evidence of an Old Testament law being a timeless moral law is if it's repeated in the New Testament. If it's repeated in the New Testament. So Genesis chapter 19 is not a good example in seeking to understand God's will with respect to homosexual unions. But I think Genesis chapter 2 and Leviticus 18 and 20 are still applicable. We're going to see more in this next week where um, both Jesus and Paul use Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, Genesis 2 as a summons for holiness. Um, they never treated the book of Leviticus as peripheral or irrelevant um, or obscure. They always went to it. Like, let me just give you a couple examples. Jesus refers to the book of Leviticus more than any other Old Testament book. Jesus quotes Leviticus 19 more than any other Old Testament passage. Love your neighbor. And not only Jesus, but other New Testament authors like Peter and like Paul, they constantly go back to the book of Leviticus as a summons for holiness today. They do not see it as peripheral. I gave one such example already, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 
And so my point is this. Many of the explicit commands we read in the New Testament come from the exact chapters that we're reading today, Leviticus 18 and Leviticus 20. But you might disagree. You might say, Justin, like it's so hard to understand um, if, in fact, it is fully the same thing, right? Because there's, there's differences of opinion. Like, what about same-sex marriage unions? You know, not, not just casual affairs. Maybe that's what's going on here. And it's hard to know the context. And if it truly applies to our context today, lots more questions that we have to address and consider. And so we're, we're going to have to suspend judgment. We're going to have to ponder this over the course of this next week in preparation for next week. But as we do that, there's a couple things that I want to lay out before you as a congregation. A couple questions for you to consider, both for those of us who are of the affirming interpretation and those of us who are of the uh, historic or traditional interpretation. Let me start with those who are our affirming friends. Here's the two questions I want to lay out before you. The first one is this. Is there something from the Old Testament that we have overlooked that we need to read again? And I mean that sincerely. For those of you who are on the traditional side, you need not ever fear reading it again. Because there have been numerous times in which we have read the text incorrectly. I gave you one such example a couple weeks ago when Galileo, he looked through his telescope and he said, I know that Psalm 96 says the earth is a firm foundation, it shall not be moved, but I'm pretty sure that the earth revolves around the sun and it's constantly in orbit. And then the church said what? They said, you're a heretic and this is a heresy. So and we've gotten things wrong. Now today, all, all we see with respect to 96 is the children's nursery rhyme. He's got the whole world in his hands. God's sovereign. He's got us. So there have been many times in which we have gotten things wrong. We should never be afraid to read the text again. Inform us. Help us. But this is, this is how I read it. And the second question is, if not, is it possible that what you think is compelling biblical evidence for the affirming position is not as compelling as you thought? And again, I, I mean this sincerely because that's where I was. That's where I was. There have been times in which God and I have disagreed on this subject. I said, God, I just, I, I don't get it. I, I don't understand. Help me understand. It, it can't be that. What's the harm? And yet, as, as I've done so much reading over the years on the subject, I'm, I'm convinced Scripture says what I've just shared you, it says. And so those are the questions I, I want to encourage you to think about this week. And for those of you who are of the traditional or historic interpretation, I want to ask you this question. Even if you think the church has gotten our position right, are there things that the church, maybe that's you personally, Maybe that's the capital C church. Maybe it's us as Gateway Church. Are there things that the church needs to repent of with respect to our posture? Are there ways in which we have been false to the truth? Because, friends, if it's true that the Bible condemns same-sex sexual relationships, and if it's true that we have family members and friends and co-workers and neighbors who have same-sex attraction and they will likely have this for the remainder of their lives, then it does no good for us to proclaim with boldness, we've gotten the position right without considering what it means to embody these truths in ways that lead to wholeness and human flourishing. I shared with you a couple weeks ago that I'm reading through Dietrich Bonhoeffer's The Cost of Discipleship again. It's my third time reading it. And one of the things that he notes in there is that when, when Christ calls a man, he bids them come and die. That's the calling for every Christian. Come and die. Die to yourself. Die to your longings. Die to your desires. It's all about Jesus. It's all about him and his word and his will for our life. And yet, that call is never just an individual call. For the sake of the church of Christ, it is always a communal calling that all of us are to walk with one another in our disordered desires, to pray for one another, to encourage one another, to weep with one another. And shame on us if we have made the church a place for heterosexual sinners only and not homosexual sinners who need us and we need them. We cannot be false to the truth. 
I want to end with a quote this morning from Wesley Hill. He has an incredible book called Washed and Waiting, and, and he says this. I, I think this resonates with this question. If same-sex friendship were more recognized, stable, and attainable in Western cultures, marriage would not have, be, be, um, have come to be seen as the essential relationship needed by gay and lesbian people to promote their own flourishing. What has animated the same-sex marriage movement, aside from the desires for public honor and protection for the lives and loves of gay and lesbian people, is the desire for home. Feel that? If our churches are going to encourage the practice of celibacy among gay and lesbian Christians, we must think more concretely and creatively about the specific forms of unity, community, and family that will enable our gay and lesbian friends to flourish while embracing their vocations. We need to be the family of God to each other. This is not an issue to be dealt with. These are people to be loved. And to the extent that we are willing to open our homes and to be surrogate aunts and uncles and grandparents and friends and brothers and sisters to each other, to truly be the family of God to each other, the Lord will bless the fruit of our labor. But the more we pontificate and stand on parking benches with signs trying to win the culture war, the more we will harm our, our brothers and sisters who are made in the image and the likeness of God who desperately need home. And we're going to talk about what that looks like more next week, but I, I want to I put that burden upon everyone in this room that we have some homework to do. Regardless of where you stand, you have questions that need answering. And so I look forward to next week as we keep the conversation going. Let's close in prayer.